Thanks very much, Paul. Well, you know, when I, uh, when I first talked to Parm uh, about coming and uh, speaking, you know, frankly, I thought I would still be standing up here as the federal uh, CISO, but that didn't happen. Uh, so I've changed actually the title of uh, my presentation from securing the front lines to some recommendations for the next administration or the new administration. You know, there's a couple of uh, issues that I think that are uh, very noteworthy that collectively all of us have to be concerned about as we try to meet our mutual goal of supporting an open and transparent government that protects the people's information while preserving privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. And the first one, and I've got only four slides here, uh, the first one is we need to fix the architecture. Right now, the current federal architecture is built on an org chart. Every single department and agency is doing their own thing. And if you take a look at how money is authorized and appropriated by the Congress, it's all based on the stovepipes. It's all based on a 1980-ish organizational chart structure. That doesn't produce results that are effective, efficient, or secure. It's completely unbalanced. And frankly, as we take a look at trying to get the right configurations, trying to uh, leverage best practices, trying to leverage cloud and mobility, and to do it securely, despite the efforts of people like you and me, ISC squared and others, to grow that next generation of cyber professionals, it's a very active marketplace. We need to consolidate our our lines. We need to do a better job. And we need a target architecture that is going to reduce our attack surface, permit us to better leverage cloud and mobility solutions that are best practices, and it needs to be capabilities focused. Now, I'm, I have three and a half years of uh, combat time downrange, but I can tell you some of the fiercest combat that I ever had was the consolidation of DOD networks. It was a 10-year protracted struggle, but we were able to prove that you can, in fact, consolidate networks. You can, in fact, consolidate email over a large organization. It's high time that in the .gov domain that we take the lessons learned that we had in the .mil domain and produce results that are more effective, efficient, and secure. And while I was uh, uh, in my federal service, uh, my team and I, we collaborated across the d different departments and agencies in the CISO Council that we formed. And this is something that we've already kick-started, and I'm hoping that the new administration is going to follow through on. And by the way, anybody know what that picture is? Uh, what? The Tacoma Narrows Bridge. That's Galloping Gertie. Great architecture at the time until it had first contact with the winds down the... Uh, the narrows itself. Amen. Okay. What's the next recommendation? We need to double down on CDM. CDM provides some capabilities that frankly we're deficient on. And if once we roll out the continuous diagnostics and mitigation program to its full extent, we're going to be able to answer what's on my network, who's on my network, and what the heck's going on on my network. Right now, there's some pockets out there in the federal government that don't have good answers to any or all of these. CDM, and you're going to have a session on this a little bit later today, this program provides some basic capabilities that are going to help answer these questions. Frankly, I believe that we are late to need on these capabilities. They should have been built in from the start. We should have baked into our network's cybersecurity uh, basics that would answer these questions and provide us these capabilities. But as we move forward, we've got to implement this program. We need this in order to better manage our risk. In the new administration, I strongly encourage them and uh, every department and agency to field these capabilities as fast as we can. Otherwise, we are not in a position to meet our mission objectives. The third proposition 
follows what uh, Parham and others have said. And that's basically, we need to follow the flight plan. And um, Parham mentioned uh, some of my uh, major strategic elements. And the first one was harden the workforce. I submit that everyone is on the cyber front lines. And everyone is an endpoint itself. And it, you know, if you take the Active Directory uh, uh, nomenclature, everybody's an object, right? Everybody's an object on the network. But if you're not cognizant of the risks that are out there, if you're not cognizant of your own vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities of the system and the architecture and the like, if you don't understand your information, how can you be expected to do your job and meet our mission objectives? We need to do a better job at hardening our workforce. We need to train better. We need to exercise more regularly. One and done annual user awareness training, I believe, is unacceptable. We need to invest better in our people. We need to treat information as an asset as well. How many folks feel really comfortable that they understand the types and classification and sensitivity and volume of all the unstructured and structured data the federal government has. Anybody? Anybody? Feel like Ferris Bueller's teacher. <laughs> and you should too. I have that not so fresh feeling when it comes to information. Most people don't understand what type of information they have. They don't understand and they, or they don't invest the time to properly classify by sensitivity and other factors so they can identify their high value assets and then implement proportional defense measures to protect that high value information. Now, we kicked off uh, an effort last year under the Cyber National Action Plan, a high value asset assessment, but I'll tell you, it was a good start. We need to really double down on understanding our information and treating it as an asset. And I speculate that in the private sector, after talking with a lot of my friends in the Fortune 100 companies, uh, um, you know, I expect that we're gonna start seeing on the annual balance sheet, folks actually writing down and documenting information as a hard asset, a capital asset, because it really, really is. Within the federal government, we better, need to better understand our information and align our defenses against the uh, proportionate defense of information. We also need to do the right things the right way. During the course of today, you're gonna also have discussions on cyber hygiene. Cyber hygiene is critically important and please pay close attention to those discussions in that panel later today. But also consider hygiene's not enough. You know, how many of you folks know who Newt Rockney was? Okay, some good hands up. You know, I'm a Pittsburgh guy, so I'm still in mourning from last night. <laughs> but Newt Rockney was the famous Notre Dame football coach who, uh, along with Frank Leahy, really put Notre Dame football on the map. As, and I'm a Nittany Lion, so I'm just completely unbiased here. Penn State, you got it. Newt Rockney said, practice makes perfect. And perhaps that's something that you uh, were taught by your parents or you learned in school. Practice makes perfect. But how many of you know what Vince Lombardi said? Perfect practice makes perfect is what Lombardi said. And whose name is on the big trophy? <laughs> Doing the right things the right way is more than just cyber hygiene. It's practicing perfectly and getting closer to perfect each and every time. We need to beef up the amount of exercises we do, and we need senior leaders and senior managers to play. Exercises shouldn't just be for the folks that have that IT and cyber stink on them. It's everybody should be playing. We also need to continually, uh, continuously innovate and invest wisely. How many of you have heard of Two Hills Law? Not a few hands, okay. So, let me explain something to you. Because picture yourself in a boardroom and you're trying to make the business case to a board why you need to recapitalize some gear or some software or maybe your entire network. Have you ever heard of the phrase one human year equals seven dog years? 
Okay. Go with me on this. Okay, is there anybody here from Health and Human Services? Nobody? Okay, well, according to the Department of uh, Health and Human Services, the average lifespan for an, an adult uh, here in the United States is 78.7 years. I'm going to round that down to 75 because it makes the math easier as I go forward. How many of you have heard of a company called Microsoft? Shameful that no more hands are not being raised. <laughs> I contend that Microsoft and great companies like it, American companies, will come out with a groundbreaking, evolutionary uh, leap forward every three years or so. Every three years or so. So if I take 75, divide that by three, I get 25. And therefore, under Two Hills Law, I submit that one human year equals 25 computer years. I further contend completely disassociated from Two Hills Law, that we have a bu bunch of computers in the federal government that are over 2,000 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's critically important, and under Tony Scott's leadership, uh, our team was trying to launch an effort to in, uh, introduce this brand new, groundbreaking, innovative, concept called depreciation and recapitalization into the federal government IT space. It is increasingly, uh, increasingly difficult to produce results that are effective, efficient, and secure when you've got antique hardware, antique software that is no longer supported by the manufacturers, when you don't have a code base that has a software development platform that can support it anymore. We need to pre-plan product improvement, and we need to do it wisely, and we need to uh, build good business cases. It's important to continuously innovate and insert new capabilities, but you know what? Equally important to retire the old stuff that's no longer keeping pace. Finally, we need to make informed cyber risk decisions at the right level. I think it's uh, contentious when you go into different departments and agencies that have had uh, breaches, when you go into private sector entities that have had breaches, and you talk to the folks that were in the server room, and they understood where the vulnerabilities were, they understood what the risk exposure was, but then you go into the boardroom, you go into the C-suite, and they're clueless, or at least they say they're clueless, or they didn't understand the magnitude. Unfortunately, in both public and private sector, across the country and around the world, we continue to see cyber risk decisions being accepted at inappropriate levels. We need to do a better job of identifying risk and communicating it at the right levels. And as the new administration moves forward, I strongly encourage them to continue the momentum that we've been building to get those risk decisions through a governance structure to the right level. Because I have found during my time in government service that when the risks are appropriately uh, codified and articulated to the decision makers, generally the right decisions get made, the right risks are identified, and people make informed decisions at the right level. We still have a long ways to go on each one of these things, and I encourage the new administration to follow that flight plan as we move forward. And then finally, we need to execute. I was uh, a bit miffed, dismayed, and uh, amused all at the same time when I saw a press report talking about my quietly resigning and the fact that, uh, <laughs> and the fact that I had not published substantive policies during my time as the federal CISO. Let me tell you, we have too many policies, and the success measure is not the number of policies, but how well you execute them. So my focus is on execution and follow through. As a matter of fact, um, our team had identified 63 different policies that we were in the process of rescinding. The clock just ran out on us, but I expect in the next coming weeks, 
that you're going to see a rescission of, uh, of those policies. For example, why do we require every CIO out there to certify that their systems are Y2K compliant? <laughs> That's just adding drag to the organization. Yeah, I think we've, we, I think we've successfully passed it, but we are gonna hold on to them in the archive for when Y3K comes around. <laughs> Follow through is critically important. You need to be able to execute, and that is something that within the federal government, and I would contend in the private sector too, this is a deficiency that we all need to work on, is following through. We need to focus also on best practices, not just compliance. I would submit that if we follow the model of you know, just, just compliance, we're never gonna get best practices just with government bureaucracy, just with private sector bureaucracy, the time it takes to put together the little compliance checklist can't keep up with the development of best practices. But by following best practices and focusing on that, I contend you'll always be in compliance. But if you follow just compliance, you'll never be in best practices. And as you're looking at due care and due diligence, best practices is critically important. And further, we need to improve accountability. We need to hold folks accountable when they are not executing their due care and due diligence, when they are not executing their tasks properly. Good order and discipline in the military is something that I learned and I enforced. And you know what? We need to do that in the public sector as well as in the private sector. We need to make sure that folks have a sense of ownership. And as a practicing uh, Catholic, I would submit maybe a sense of guilt as time uh, goes as well. <laughs> but you know what? Execution is critically important, and it's something that in the public sector has not been uniformly a measure of excellence. It needs to be. And how do you follow through? How do you continually ex execute well? You need to continually monitor how you're doing. CDM's gonna help with that. But you also need to continuously exercise. Do you think Jack Nicholas has a pretty good follow through? I would submit, yeah, that's a pretty sweet swing. And as a Air Force officer, I golfed every year whether I needed it or not. <laughs> but Jack Nicholas is a Hall of Famer. He's a household name because he practiced, practiced, practiced. He got better, better, and better. We need to do, get better, better, and better in the federal government. I believe that the uh, areas that I've covered here are solid recommendations, not only for the new administration, but for you and your businesses, you and your departments and agencies, even at home. This is a flight plan that I believe is executable, it's feasible, it's acceptable, it's suitable, and we need to be smart about it and make it affordable as well. And with that, I'd like to thank our uh, sponsors for today. Thank you so much for uh, hosting us today. I think we're gonna have a great conversation. And do I have time for two questions? Yeah. I'd have time for two questions. Sir. I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, are, are you some asking what role the government has in underwriting commercial ventures? No, quantum computers yeah. have the ability to decrypt asymmetric, asymmetric. Oh, yeah, okay. So. What is the government doing? <coughs> they are going commercial. Hmm. Yeah, there's, <laughs> the federal government is spending a butt ton of your money um, in research and development, taking a look at quantum computing and other emerging technologies that are out there. However, um, as you take a look at quantum computing, for example, which is one of many different technologies that's out there, uh, there's also, I would contend, um, a, a lot of uh, research and development into mathematics and algorithms as well. 
that there's being uh, invested in by the federal government. Gr probably the most noteworthy is the DARPA organization, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Homeland Security has now stood up an advanced research proje uh, project agency in Homeland Security. DOE Labs, thank you, Cheryl, I appreciate it. By the way, Cheryl Peace, acting CIO of uh, Energy. Descent on her later, okay. <laughs> um, National Science Foundation is uh, doing some investments. There's also, uh, uh, across a multitude of uh, departments from education onward, the folks are investing in some innovative and cutting edge technologies. Now that said, I don't think the government by itself should be the only investor in looking at new technologies. And you mentioned Google and some other uh, folks that are out there who are in, in investing a great deal of money as well because they view some of these technologies as providing a mechanism for adding value to their companies as well. And strongly encourage incentives for research and development and those type of investments. Okay, thank you. Guy with the, uh, I'll get to you in the hat, I'll give you a bonus one, but the gentleman here with the, uh, the scarf. Hi. Uh, first off, Leon. Second of all, um, everything that you talked about is great and good, but I'm curious about something. Like, my question to you is, Only 5%? five percent. I'm used to seeing it at four. <laughs> how do you take? How do you take? That's your skill. How do you take the uh, evangelistic word, if you will, and have C-level execs, corporate execs, either in private industry or government, really understand that you're not there just for a paycheck, right? How, how do you? How do you? How do you propose? Right. There's only so much that I can fit into a 20-minute presentation, so I do have to keep it at the strategic level. But let me uh, address this. First of all, you've got to make your business case, and you also have to have your, um, I, I won't call it an elevator speech, but I mean, it's, you've got to be concise in making the business case. You know, for example, if you take a look at uh, the OPM breach, okay, how much did it cost for the identity theft protection contracts? About $100 million a year for 10 years, $1 billion. So are you calculating it at? So well, let me, no, 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 let me finish. Let me finish. So if I'm going to go in there and I'm going to make my business case, multi-factor authentication, for example, one of my favorites, great countermeasure, or whitelisting. There's, you've got to make the business case. You say, here's what I want to do. Here's the threat that's out there that it could act on this. By the way, this. This capability blocks or you know plugs up a weakness here in this vulnerability. Here's what the cost is. Here's what the potential cost of consequence would be. So it's a pay me now, pay me later type of uh, discussion. You need to be able to prepare to do that. And you need to also take a look at the total cost of ownership of that countermeasure and that compensating control. Often folks just come out there and they say, hey, I want to go buy this tool. And for guys that are sitting on the board, they say, oh, that's really cool. It's really, a, you're, you're presenting it more as a toy, as a tool. You're not showing me what the true business case is. Total cost of ownership, how long do I need to own this? And oh, by the way, what happens if I don't? And then further, I don't want to go and spend 10 bucks to protect five bucks worth of information. We as a community need to do a better job speaking the business language as opposed to just the technology language. So uh, we could take that conversation offline because there's some other great speakers coming up and I've got a bonus question that I've got to give and then I got to, I'll be very I, quick. okay, because yeah. I'm getting the end, so like, let's go. <laughs>
yourself was that when you can't address them as business problems, then the decisions are made at the wrong level because they can't understand it's actually a decision that needs to be made in the executive level. Right. And all, as well, when we, even when we address them as a business problem, the question we always get asked is, hey, okay, so it's going to cost X number of dollars to protect against this, but what's the chance it's actually going to happen to mm -hmm. us? And that's always the question that makes me break my teeth because the answer that we all know is 100%. That's a beer discussion. Uh, but, 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 but as I get off the stage, I, I hope that during the course of today, and as a follow-up to that last question, is that all of us remember that cybersecurity is not a technology issue in and of itself. It is really a risk management decision. It is a risk management issue. It's something that we all have to face. And if we follow best practices for managing risk, we're going to do a better job, not only in the public sector, but in the private sector. I look forward to uh, uh, meeting some of you uh, during this morning session while I'm here. And I thank you very much for your kind attention.